Welcome to the 18th program in our America at a Crossroads series of virtual town halls. I'm David Alaire, president of Community Advocates, the co-founders of the series, along with Jamina Kamina Resnick and Jews United for Democracy and Justice, organizations dedicated to preserving and protecting our democracy. I welcome you on behalf of the leadership of both organizations, Mel Levine, Zev Yaroslavsky, Caroline Kemi, Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chase, and Janice and myself. We plan to complete the discussion in time for those who would like to watch night three of the Republican convention, which will start in a little under an hour. Janice will introduce tonight's programs. I'd like to call your attention to upcoming evenings. Next week on September 2nd, we're very excited to host New Yorker writer and CNN legal analyst, Jeffrey Tubin, author of the just released and acclaimed True Crimes and Misdemeanors, The Investigation of Donald Trump. Tubin will be in conversation with Henry Weinstein, professor at UC Irvine's law school and longtime legal reporter for the Los Angeles Times. The following week, we will have noted analyst Ron Brownstein of The Atlantic in dialogue with KCRW's Warren Olney, discussing restoration, the struggle between America's past and future. We're grateful to our co-sponsors who have helped these programs remain among the most popular in the Jewish virtual world. Over the past several months, we have consistently been one of the top three most watched broadcast broadcasts nationwide. We thank Valley Beth Shalom, Temple Israel of Hollywood, Ikar, Stephen S. Wise Temple, the Jewish Center for Justice, Temple Beth Am, the LA Museum of the Holocaust, Leo Beck Temple, Temple Isaiah, and the newspaper, The Forward. We're grateful to you for your comments and continuing support. It means a lot to us. It's now my personal pleasure to introduce my colleague, my partner, and my friend, Janice Kamen Resnick, with whom it has been a joy to work. Her commitment and vigor are contagious. She's the founder of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and a dynamo who keeps us all on our toes. Janice? <laughs> Thank you, David. It's great to be with you tonight. Um, thank you to our audience. Even though we don't see you, we know you're there and we really appreciate your loyalty and your interest in what we're trying to accomplish. For tonight's program called Rights on the Line, Protecting the Vote in the Era of Trump, we have three outstanding guests. Uh, Benjamin Jealous is an American civic leader who is currently the president and CEO of People for the American Way. People for the American Way is an organization founded by the great Norman Lear and the great late Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. For 40 years, People for the American Way has been fighting extremism and advocating for equality, freedom, justice, and opportunity for all Americans. Prior to coming to People for the American Way, uh, Jealous had a wildly successful decade as the youngest ever president and CEO of the NAACP. He is a graduate of Columbia University and Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and he has taught at Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania. It's wonderful, Mr. Jealous. Rabbi David Saperstein is another remarkable social justice hero. A rabbi and a lawyer, David combined his passions by serving as the director and chief legal counsel at the Union for Reform Judaism's Religious Action Center, known as the RAC, for more than three decades. There, he inspired the entire American Jewish community and beyond in the arena of social justice and activism. While at the RAC, Rabbi Saperstein was designated by Newsweek as the most influential rabbi in America and by the Washington Post as the quintessential religious lobbyist on Capitol Hill. In 2015, Rabbi Saperstein was appointed by President Obama, U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. He was the first non-Christian named to that position and he has served on nas many national boards, uh, including the NAACP and People for the American Way. And oh, by the way, it's great to have you with us, Rabbi Saperstein. It's really a pleasure and an honor for us. And for those of us in Los Angeles, Larry Mantle needs no introduction as he is a fixture in our daily lives. He has been the host of Air Talk on NPR member station KPCC since 1985. Air Talk is the longest running daily talk show in Southern California. He is known for his kind yet probing and incisive interview style. 
a fourth generation Angelino. Larry has interviewed, you may be the only one of those on this call today, by the way. Uh, Larry has interviewed thousands of prominent guests on an extraordinary array of topics and received many journalistic awards in the process, including a golden mic and an associated press honor. And he was recognized by the Los Angeles Press Club under the best talk show category. Welcome back to our America at a Crossroads series, Larry. And now to start our conversation, here's Larry Mantle. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be with you again for one of these very important conversations uh, in this year where so many important decisions will be made by Americans. Uh, today, as you might well have heard, uh, we've seen professional sports respond very strongly to the events in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, just about two hours three hours ago, uh, NBA teams uh, decided, uh, apparently along with support from the league, to uh, postpone all of the playoff games that were scheduled tonight, including the Los Angeles Lakers playoff game against the Portland Trail Blazers. It began with the um, Milwaukee Bucks uh, deciding uh, not to come out of the locker room for the tip-off of the game in protest over uh, the events uh, involving Jacob Blake, uh, the man who was shot and very seriously injured by a Kenosha, Wisconsin police officer. Last night, we had two people killed, uh, allegedly by a 17-year-old who was arrested today on suspicion of using a rifle uh, to shoot uh, those individuals, three in total, were struck, two of them killed uh, at last night's protests in Kenosha. Uh, the governor of Wisconsin has called out uh, for additional law enforcement and for National Guard personnel uh, to attempt to deal with the events there. Uh, first, Ben Jealous, it's good to see you again. Uh, appreciate you, your being sir. here. Ben, let me, let me ask you just first of all, um, as the former head of the NAACP, what is the potential impact of the NBA's response, several Major League Baseball games being postponed tonight, and the entire slate of WNBA games also being postponed? Well, let me say before I, I, I start and respond, just what a joy it is to be with all of you tonight and how much I appreciate the invitation. And it's really nice to be here with my good friend, David. Um, the two of us really uh, have each as a point of sort of personal responsibility, taking on helping to maintain at the leadership level, the strong relationship between our two communities. I'm also the former president of the uh, Rosenberg Foundation in San Francisco, which is a Jewish institution that supports the civil rights movement. Um, I, uh, I'm deeply moved by what we've seen tonight by the players. It would note it's four years to the day since Colin Kaepernick uh, began kneeling. And, uh, you know, as we say, I think in many faith traditions, you know, uh, God may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. And so it is about the solidarity amongst the players. It may not have come uh, when Colin wanted it, but it was, it is right on time. And uh, this is a time when we would expect to see sort of a healing presence from the White House calling, calling for calm. I mean, even even Richard Nixon in these moments would be calling for calm. Instead, we've seen a president double, triple, quadruple down. There, is, you know, there are reports that there's even a photograph that suggests that this young man was at a Trump rally. What we do know for sure is that at the RNC, they have on stage a couple, the McCluskeys, who brandished guns at protesters. What we do know is that uh, Donald Trump He's now saying he's gonna send the National Guard there. It's, it's a campaign move for him. He's so callous. What we do know is that this young man, there are also reports was, was cheered along with other armed protesters last night, including reportedly by some police officers. This is a moment when the president should be calling for healing. It is not happening. So I'm very pleased that the players who in some ways have the attention of even more people in this country than the president are, are stepping up and courageously saying, this must stop. There is no more business as usual. And I just want to clarify, at least the reports that I've seen, it was not that um, law enforcement officers were, were encouraging violence against protesters, 
but we're thanking uh, the armed people who were coming out uh, for being there. Um, well, I suppose as in spirit of backup uh, yeah. to the law enforcement officers. Right, right, right. but um, that, that, there's no place for that in a, in a democracy. It is not, you, you know, folks would say in California, there were, you know, sort of the first instance of special legislation was for the Black Panther Party uh, to make sure that they could not carry guns in public in accordance with the law. And so, you know, this is just a reminder and when Dylan Roof was arrested uh, after killing, after massacring uh, the uh, members of Mother uh, Emanuel Church, um, including uh, the pastor who was an active NAACP member and a friend, the police took him out for a hamburger and they didn't shoot him. And so there is a double standard when it comes to carrying weapons in this country. And it is very, very dangerous. And the, and, the, and the president having the McCluskeys on stage, the officers tolerating people showing up, acting as if they are there to back up the police, apparently not. Apparently there was a young man there who was aided and abetted by the police officers not taking his rifle from him. Let me ask you, uh, David, about uh, this action by professional athletes and uh, the power of that statement. What changes will it potentially bring? Penny Lamer famously said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. The problem of racism in this country has reached a level um, and a level of awareness by the nation that cries out for people to take action. None of us can solve the problem alone, but all of us are capable of saying, we will not stand idly by the blood of our neighbor. All of us are capable of doing something to help raise awareness, to demand action, and shape a better, fairer, more compassionate America. So when athletes step up, there may be limits to what we can do at this moment, other than to say we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, other than to say we won't stand idly by, that we have to do something to say that the status quo is broken on this issue of race, and it demands for us, for people of moral conscience, to do what we would hope the president would do, what we would hope political leaders in both parties would do, to say it is time for us to take steps to address these issues, including the disproportionate use of violence uh, against people of uh, color um, by law enforcement officials. Um, uh, all of this really requires action at this point. But it is a broader question, and I think they're saying enough, and we have to act. Ben, the, yes, go ahead, Ben. I'm sorry. If I may, and what the players remind us is the importance for each of us to have courage in our own lives. And I would say like uncomfortable uh, amounts, exercise uncomfortable amounts of courage. Um, I was talking recently to um, the San Francisco office of Goldman Sachs. A friend there asked, if you just come talk you know, to us, people are trying to figure out what's going on. And I was going through their website and on it, it said uh, that the sons of Samuel Sachs, the co-founder of Goldman Sachs, Mr. Sachs, if you will, um, who were themselves partners at the firm. One was a founding leader in the NAACP, I knew that, and the other was a founding leader in the National Urban League. Uh, Mr. Sachs's son, if you will, the younger Mr. Sachs was actually our treasurer for most of our first decade. I want you to think about that for a second. The NAACP at that time was a radical anti-lynching organization, the same way that Black Lives Matter right now is, a, if you will, a radical anti-police killing organization. It was not what the NAACP is today, a $10 billion brand at some level of sort of acceptance broadly throughout American society. Uh, the, the, the founding president was, re, was reputed to be a socialist, and yet here you had a capitalist. Uh, Goldman Sachs, the son of the founder saying, no, I'll sign the, the articles of incorporation. I'll serve as the treasurer. So when we're talking about sort of uncomfortable courage, we have examples going back very far in our society. It's one of the best things we can do as Americans is to say that I'm gonna go a little further uh, in, in, in seeking to make change in my time than I or my colleagues might, might otherwise feel comfortable with. Ben, what, what would you say to those, this is a great example you just gave with the NAACP and Goldman Sachs, because 
I'm sure there are many Americans who feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm anti-racism, but Black Lives Matter political platform is one I can't abide. And that's not an America I would want to see. So what would you say to those Americans who um, would not want to have any truck with the politics of, of the Black Lives Matter organization, but support the cause? We all have to find our way uh, to show courage, to take action. The most important actions any of us can take right now, frankly, are to unelect politicians who are tolerant of police killings. That was how we shut down lynching in this country, which quite frankly, both of our, our communities found themselves in the crosshairs of. And the reality was that we didn't pass federal legislation, never happened. Cory Booker was trying to win that argument like a month and a half ago uh, and debating Rand Paul. Uh, and we barely passed um, state level legislation. A couple of states, South Carolina famously, never brought an anti, never used lynching legislation to go after the Klan or any white person. Um, and then, uh, but what, what did we do? Uh, we unelected mayors, city council people, even US senators who blocked uh, uh, anti-lynching legislation, who tolerated lynch mobs in their midst. And you know, that's, that's what we need more of right now. And all of us can be part of that. And it means being a single issue voter for a while on local elections. This is about, but, but honestly, is there really anything more important that your mayor could do or your city council person could do than to put an end to the killing of unarmed uh, neighbors uh, by the very officers who have sworn to protect them? Let's talk about what you think would do that. Because here in California, in the 2019 legislative year, uh, there was a, a bill that was passed, signed into law, which raised uh, the, the standards uh, for when lethal force could be used by a law enforcement officer. There are an array of bills in Sacramento right now. We're about a week away from the deadline uh, for those bills uh, to be considered for passage. And uh, everything from uh, uh, officers having to uh, uh, clearer mandate to report abuse by fellow officers, uh, statewide database of problem officers so they're not rehired by other departments, uh, and officer evaluations to determine racial bias. Mm. If, you, if you could pick one that you think would be the essential when it comes to police violence, what would it be? Delicensing police officers who, who shoot people unnecessarily or otherwise are violent unnecessarily. We need to think for a second. Uh, think about any professional you know who's licensed. Now imagine that they did to George Floyd what that officer did. Now imagine what would, what, what would be going on with their licensing board. There's not a doctor in America who could choke a man to death uh, and, you know, while, while serving as a doctor uh, and ever practice medicine again. And yet with police officers, it is almost a certainty that they will not be decommissioned as officers. Think about that. We have allowed police unions in our country uh, to make it almost impossible to fire the worst amongst them. And here's the, the problem. When you look at the surveys of officers, what you'll find is about 10% of them are a real problem. They are a danger and a menace to society. About 75% of them are, um, excuse me, about 15% of them are courageous, are willing to stand up, are willing to report. And about 75% are, are the thin blue line, if you will, that toes the line, that protects the, the bad 10% and, 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 and ostracizes the courageous 15% by their silence, by their refusal to act, by their insistence on a level of solidarity that is simply deadly. And it's not just deadly to my community. I wanna be clear about this. Um, we are the canaries in the coal mine. Um, you know, in between Philando Castile uh, and George Floyd in Minneapolis, a white woman was killed completely unnecessarily by the cops. In Kenosha, when you dig in the history, the last big case there was the case of Michael Bell, a white man who was shot in the head by the police and no one was charged. And so we have to get bad officers off the force. It's the number one thing we could do. You know, the second thing I would say is we have to keep them from coming onto the force. If you look at the research of Philip Goff, who is really the leading expert in the country on why Americans get killed by, by, by police officers, two things jump out at you. One is that the most commonly uttered last word before somebody is shot by the police is the epithet for a gay man that starts with the letter F. 
I mean, sticks and stones, right? Like these are people who are licensed to kill. They're, they're professionally trained. And yet somebody insults their masculinity, if you, if you will, questions their sexual orientation and they have a license to kill us. And then you look at his actual live uh, subject studies. He did some in Southern California. And I once signed a waiver and everything I signed to, to watch them. And what did he do, Larry? He uh, implicit bias test to basically figure out how racist these officers were. And he did a test on what they call aggressive masculinity. Uh, I think a, a less gendered term would be authoritarian, these officers were. And he showed videos of two officers, both happened to be white. One was older, think of him like Archie Bunker. He was older, he was off the charts on the implicit bias scale, but he was very chill. He was not authoritarian at all. The other one was the opposite. He was young. He was not, didn't appear to be racist at all, even in any of the tests. And he was off the charts in authoritarianism. The Archie Bunker, the Archie Bunker officer talked, uh, a step, an actor pretending to be a deranged black man with a stick down in three minutes. Uh, the young guy shot him in 15 seconds. And so what we know is that we can use personality tests in a different way to actually weed out the officers who are there, if you will, for the spirit of adventure, not a spirit to serve, and who are authoritarian. And it's actually the authoritarians who are the most deadly. Uh, race is a problem. Um, it can lead to abuse, but if you want to know why people get killed, it's authoritarianism. And that, of course, can be officers of any color. And of course, you know, the question is the scientific validity of that testing. And there's a lot of, as you know, debate about what that really measures and, and the accuracy of that testing. But, um, but important point you make about that, that sort of approach to law enforcement. David, I want to ask you about political action. You've got thousands of young people who've taken to the streets across the country after the killing of George Floyd and protesting um, long-standing entrenched racism, protesting, police abuse. How does that translate, does it translate into people, young people turning out and voting? If I can just add one note on the police uh, uh, violence um, issue here. You asked the question and gave a number of alternatives. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us probably agree there is no answer. The studies show, you know, training alone doesn't really have a demonstrable impact. Uh, it's, it's going to be a combination of those things. But one thing that has to be part of it is how we deal with people with mental illness. A very high percentage of people who end up being shot, people of color who end up being shot are those who have mental who are unarmed, have mental problems. And in those cities where they've really try to find alternative ways of confronting people in that regard, it has had some real uh, impact. So I just wanted to, um, uh, to add that, look, this is an extraordinary moment. The numbers of people who are out in the protests surpasses any similar protests within a given period of time that we have seen in the history of the country. It really is a remarkable moment at that time. One can only translate from that, um, uh, that so long as people don't give up on the system altogether, it will have an impact on the numbers of people coming to the polls. There may be some who, uh, judging from the reaction, the resistance to change, just give up on the system and, and find other ways other than voting. The important thing, it seems to me, that people of both parties have to do is to really try to say, this is a moment where everyone needs to get to the polls. Well, and I'm sorry that, uh, that there are some who are taking efforts to try to, to change the voting system in ways that would preclude um, large segments of the community from voting. G given that so many states are looking at vote by mail with COVID-19, California sending a ballot to every active registered voter, that's the default. Others, some other states are taking that same method. Will that spur more young people to turn out. Uh, we know that vote by mail is popular among rural people and many older voters. How does it affect the young electorate? I think, well, you know, I think uh, voting by mail will encourage people in general to turn out. I, I think there's a real fear about going to polls, standing in lines, um, standing in crowds, the carelessness of people who are resistant to wearing masks, who may be right in front or in back of them um, in, in line. Um, uh, so I really do believe that it will make a difference when you put the two questions you just asked together, 
the energy of the masses of people who are protesting, predominantly young people, young people who have never really been involved um, uh, before, I think the ability to be able to vote at home combined with that will have a demonstrable impact. I would expect to see the levels um, that we saw in the uh, Barack Obama uh, elections in terms of the turnout of young people, if not even larger now. Uh, yeah, Vangelis. Yeah. yeah, I would put an asterisk on that, which is um, after a couple of cycles, when vote by mail normalizes, I think everything that Rabbi Saperstein says is absolutely true. But the first election, if it's the first election in your jurisdiction, it's literally the adoption of a new technology. Even as old as voting is, it's, I mean, and as old as the mail is, a lot of people have never put the two together. Um, and so you can end up with a lot of confusion. And, and it actually, there are some studies that, that suggest that it may actually benefit the more conservative candidates in those jurisdictions because the people who tend to adopt vote by mail the easiest are the people with the greatest uh, connection with the mail and who are the, have the most stable addresses. And so you're talking about older people and more privileged people. And well, we know how that, how that trends as far as, as voting. So we're not taking any of that for granted. Now, COVID has made it more complex because on you know, the black community, for example, we have our Souls to the Polls program. Well, if Souls to the Polls was a church bus, COVID just slashed three of the tires. So the way that we are adapting at People4, we have 1,300 young elected officials across the country in our Young People4 network. You know, they, the, the first class was a bunch of rock stars with Stacey Abrams, the Castro brothers, Kristen Cinema, other folks who come through it, Pete Buttigieg, and a range of others. And, and what we're having them do, uh, and you know, these are you know, overwhelmingly at the, at the city local level uh, or the state level, is they will hold press conferences across this count, the, the country uh, on October 2nd uh, out of a tradition in, in our community, frankly, when one of our leaders is assassinated or uh, when one of our leaders uh, is killed sort of in the midst of battle. Um, and they'll say, you know, uh, some folks may have hoped that the movement to defend the black vote, the movement to defend voting rights died with John Lewis. Well, let's be clear, we're gonna center the 300 of, of our 1300 who are black and they'll be framed by a thousand a rainbow uh, of a thousand others. Uh, and I'll say, you know, let's, uh, let's be clear, John Lewis incurred, you know, inspired us into public service. And if he's not here to play this role at this moment, then we will be John Lewis in this moment. And what that will announce is a massive peer-to-peer -peer GOTV texting effort focused specifically at young voters across this country. Is this the first time, Ben, this is being done using this kind of a text campaign this way? Certainly it's the first time that's being done in mass by young elected officials across the country. Um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer texting has kind of come on the scene since 2016, but, it's the, but, but we are using it, if you will, we, have, we also have 3,000 black pastors organized at, at uh, People4, and so we had to make a shift from a church-based program that there was almost no way to implement in the current context to a new uh, strategy. And so we turned, if you will, to the youngest leaders in, in our room, and those are our young young officials. David, let me ask you about the biggest impediment to voting as you see it. Now, California, to deal with any delay from the post office, uh, it passed a bill giving 17 days post-election day for ballots to be received. So trying to deal with any delay with the mail. But what do you see as the biggest impediments to people coming out and voting and their votes being counted? I mean, again, I think COVID is uh, here, but let me just switch for a minute to just point out that if you look at the pure largest number of people affected by the various uh, techniques that states that have trying to block people from voting have used. It's those who have put in burdensome photo IDs. Um, it's estimated that over 10% of the population, voting population of the United States actually do not have the kind of uh, ID that they would need to meet the requirements in their states. And that's just one technique of a number of techniques um, that have been used to suppress the votes in a number of states. So you put the two things together, COVID making people fearful about going out to the polls, being in crowds um, uh, here, together with the, the longer standing obstacles, uh, including the burdensome um, ID photos. And I, I think that there are some 
serious challenges that a lot of civic groups, nonpartisan groups are all working together, including throughout the faith community, um, uh, to try and help remedy. Uh, ben, I want to ask you about um, efforts to keep the intensity level high among young voters, particularly, and you mentioned using the young uh, elected officials as, as a way to do that. But uh, what about social media? What, what are some of the ways, I mean, years ago, MTV did a very popular Rock the Vote campaign, which was credited with, with really spurring increased voter turnout. Many young people wouldn't even think about voting. It was not that they were anti-voting, it just wasn't even on the radar. What's comparable today to do that? You know, really, peer-to-peer uh, -peer text and technology, I believe, it sort of has the, is accepted by the receiver with the greatest integrity. One of the things that's happened since that Rock, rock the Vote campaign, or even just the advent of social media, uh, has been all of the disinformation on the web. And young people, you know, are savvy. I mean, you know, I was earlier today talking about uh, the uh, movie, The Great Hack, um, which is up for an Emmy right now. And is, you know, if you haven't seen it on Netflix is, is, is worth watching because what it, what it really you know, talks about is the fact that we're being manipulated through social media in a massive way. Um, and there's all this different from this disinformation. You can look at the QAnon conspiracy theory, which in the past would not have gotten any uh, traction. And yet because of the way uh, that social media is used by groups seeking to do mischief has become very, very popular. And so social media has in some ways been dis discredited uh, in the eyes of many young people who are bombarded with all these crazy messages all the time because they're always on there. You know, look at my 14 year old on Snapchat. Um, and so, so they're treating them um, like TV ads, essentially. Yeah, so exactly. I mean, with that skepticism. Yeah. You, you, you got to figure out how you break through. And, the one, and, and that's where peer-to-peer -peer texting comes in. That's where, where you know, um, conversations, you know, between folks come in. That's where phone banking is important. People, there's no replacing right now just having conversations with young people about the importance of voting. And let's be really clear. Young people will decide this election. If they turn out, Trump loses. Uh, if they stay home, Trump wins. It's so young voters, it's not suburban white women as you see it. It's, it's really young voters that are the pivot point. Absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, the, the, as far as um, where GOTV will decide it, I mean, there's a debate, you know, there's a fight that's still going on right now for regular voters and who they're going to vote for. But we're going to get into a phase about a month out where it's, you know, people's minds will have been made up. Voting will be starting, you know, it will start weeks out in many places. And in that phase, in the GOTV phase, it'll all be about turning out young people. Right now, I'd say one of the most important things to do, this is something that we specialize in at People For, is fighting for the allegiance of Latino voters in swing states. There are about 40% of Latinos who, who tend to naturally line up with the Republican candidate why? Because they're, those candidates tend to be pro-business and anti-abortion. And yet you can move 10 or 20 or in some focus groups in some states, 30 points of that into the Democratic column. Uh, you know, this is work that we do, just talking about our C4 work, uh, but you've got to advertise them in Spanish language on radio and on television. And right now, if you look at what's happening on Spanish language radio and Spanish language television, last report I saw, Trump was outspending Biden 10 to 1. Trump is hold, knows that he has to hold the line at around 40% in the Latino community. If he gets below 30, uh, then the Democrat tends to win. If he can push above 40, the Republican tends to win. Even in states like Wisconsin, you may not think of as a big Latino population. The Latino population there is six times the margin. The Latino voting population, talking about regular Latino voters in Wisconsin, are 6x Trump's margin of victory. Uh, David, uh, with so many younger voters, you know, being drawn to Bernie Sanders' campaign um, and progressives having uneasy feelings, many of them, about Joe Biden, um, is, is that going to be the biggest obstacle to get young voters out? It's Joe Snow Bernie. It'll, it'll be one obstacle. Um, you know, but Bernie Sanders, I thought, made a very compelling um, argument for supporting Joe Biden. I think the contrast between the Democratic and the Republican candidates will get young people to line up whichever one they support, but with a very clear sense of a difference um, uh, between the two of them. And every community tries to find creative ways of 
uh, of increasing the vote. Uh, if you remember back to the Obama election in 2008 and the great schlep with young Jews calling their grandparents in Florida, always a crucial swing state um, uh, to get out and vote. And that time, mostly focused on voting for um, Obama um, uh, here. But I do want to add to what Ben said. Let's not forget about suburban women and let's not forget about women of color. Um, they are going to be swing votes. The turnout amongst um, women of color and the swing vote um, of the uh, suburban women. Um, you, you look at Arizona where Mark Kelly is leading uh, Senator McSally here by a two to one margin among women voters. And in North Carolina, Cal Cunningham leads Tom uh, Tillis by nine points, um, uh, uh, 22 points in terms of uh, uh, the, the vote amongst uh, women. Uh, you have similar things in, in a variety of states. Women are going to be the vote and in suburban women um, uh, generally educated suburban women are going to be important. But since 2000, there's been an increase in non-Hispanic women voters of 8% uh, from 2000 until today. Um, uh, 6 million uh, potential uh, voters who have uh, registered. That increase amongst women of color is 59% compared to that 8%. Um, I hear they are going to have an enormous impact um, in this election. So women are crucially important, young people are important. Whichever party is able to reach out to a wide segment of these swing uh, uh, communities in terms of getting out the vote or swinging one way or the other is the one that's going to win. Well, and my understanding is African-American women are about the most faithful voters of any group and have historically been extremely high percentage uh, voters in election. Let, let's ask uh, some questions from uh, viewers to our conversation. Lori asks, um, do you think that um, some of the events that have happened around the peaceful protests, things that weren't peaceful that happened with them, that that might not end up helping President Trump? And is there a role for elected officials and faith leaders in trying to bring calm to the community? David, do you want to start on that? I mean, I think in every uh, place that there's been a shooting and uh, protests that have spilled into violence, faith communities have worked together to provide an interfaith, multi-faith response, um, urging for nonviolent uh, uh, reactions. In some communities, it has had an impact. In some of the St. Louis communities, um, and going back a few years, in other communities, that is an impact. In some, it depends what the source of the violence is and who's doing it. Um, if people have come with the intent of participating in violence, it's different than if it happens spontaneously in terms of confrontation with uh, law enforcement officials. Um, uh, et cetera. And the latter, um, if the faith community can be, um, uh, can be more effective. But yes, uh, I think uh, if you look back, the Republican Party has tried to use as a political weapon uh, violence, if you think about um, uh, uh, the first George Bush, uh, in terms of that election, you think about Richard Nixon, law and order um, uh, uh, candidate, and uh, I presume that it will be a major part, it seems to be, and I uh, imagine we will continue uh, in terms of President Trump's messages. Well, I mean, well, when we look at gun sales, which have been so high as well, clearly there's a segment of the American populace that's, that's very concerned about safety. Ben, your, your thoughts on how this plays? Well, I think, you know, We've seen Donald Trump um, use uh, the Secret Service to clear the park so he could go stand in front of a church for a photo op. Um, we've seen Donald Trump now say that he's sending um, you know, federal troops uh, to uh, Wisconsin. We've seen uh, federal, federal marshals deployed in a very provocative way in Oregon. And you know, I, I do believe that history will show that this president tried to, to frankly use uh, federal, uh, federal law enforcement, federal troops, uh, frankly, to uh, stoke tension, uh, not to disperse it. Your question was about the responsibility of faith leaders in, say, in Baltimore, when we had uprisings after the Freddie Gray case about a half decade ago. One of the smartest things that we did uh, was on the second day after the first night, if you will, we um, on social media put out a call to basically the protesters who were in the streets. We got three or 400 of them in one room 
and we put them through intensive nonviolent civil disobedience training. And then we sent them back out to seed the crowd. And night two was very different. We have to begin doing nonviolent civil disobedience training again. Uh, that I helped to put that together, but it was the idea of Jamal Bryant, a black pastor, the long history in the civil rights movement, who said to me quite plainly, Ben, our parents were trained, our grandparents were trained, we were trained by the Free South Africa movement, but nobody has trained this young, these young people and it's dangerous. And when you look right now, when you look at the interference of foreign state actors and social media who are literally organizing protests, there are QAnon protests, there have been Russian intelligence organized protests, in the U.S., uh, it, it is not a short, you know, it is a short leap to believe that there are agent provocateurs. I've seen aerial, I've been on CNN Live looking at aerials of protest and watch one person repeatedly confront the police in a crowd of peaceful protesters trying to turn that crowd against that officer. And in the, and, and, and in that moment, I saw a man in a, in, a, in a dark suit and a dark tie, which in the midst of a protest is oftentimes the sign of, uh, you know, in, in the black uh, community of a um, minister or a pastor. He was, stood out from everybody else. And he walked over and he uh, cleared the crowd and he got the officer out of the crowd. And that's what happens when you do nonviolent civil disobedience training is you, you actually train people to be marshals and you train them to spot situations like that and to diffuse and to deescalate. So one of the things all of our houses of worship of every faith can do is to actually organize even online nonviolent civil disobedience training in these moments. Right. A lot of us are going out into crowds. We have not been trained and that is fertile ground for mischief. Uh we have a question from Doug who asks, should Democrats put more emphasis on the importance of the president's Supreme Court nominations? Uh, ben, you want to start with that? Yes, absolutely. This has been a, f a fixation of ours at People for since the very beginning. This is part of Norman Lear and Barbara Jordan's legacy. Um, and, uh, you know, the NAACP, we would say, is many things. And, and as Robert Sabertine and I both recognize, it is one of the lo longest standing examples of the cooperation of our two communities in the civil rights sphere. And in that respect, uh, the founding of People for is similar. Um, uh, and we have been focused on the courts. Trump has appointed 200 federal judges, more than that, I think, at this point, but at least 200 federal judges. We're now beginning to run ads uh, in places um, like against Ms. Ernst in Iowa, really f focusing on the fact that these judges are being appointed for many reasons, but among them, destroying healthcare, destroying the ACA, destroying Obamacare. And I say that, say that it's important. You know, if you look at the rise of conservative judges, you look at the, rel at, 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 at the tough road that our movement has had in kind of keeping up with them, it's not just that they, they focus on the courts, they focus on the courts with a wedge issue, which for them is abortion. Well, we focus on the courts without a wedge issue. And I, and I would say that the issue that we need to focus on for decades is the issue of healthcare in this country. It, it cuts across and it pushes back uh, on those who would use abortion to um, sort of get populist support for a conservative candidate. The moment that you say that that candidate is there, truthfully, to destroy Obamacare, it slows their role. And so that's, I think right now, we need to focus on these senators who have been supporting judges uh, who are there to destroy Obamacare and be very clear about that when we're dealing with swing voters. If you're on the phone, if you're calling into states trying to help take back the Senate, I would absolutely talk about the fact that they have been rubber stamping judges whose sole purpose is to destroy Obamacare. Of course, the challenge is getting the passion level up on that to the level what for Republicans abortion is. But David, I wanted to ask... ask uh, Larry, you're absolutely yeah. right, though. It is, the challenge is getting the passion level up. The polls have shown over the years that Republicans see that as an important issue at a much higher rate, that they will vote on at a much higher rate than Democrats uh, uh, do. And with the shift in this court with more conservative judges, younger judges, I think really has shaken uh, uh, people to recognize that there is a danger now, but it'll be a real challenge for the Democrats to make it into what should be an obvious issue um, in terms of the preservation of the core liberties 
court, court freedoms that for so many uh, in America has made America uh, the great country that it has that are under attack and uh, being endangered by a court that has become far more ideological than in the past. Uh, well, yes. is that the good news is that there is a lot of energy on the on the healthcare issue. It has been building over decades on this country, and honestly, we, we're in the midst of a global pan, pan, pandemic. And if you saw the polls that I've seen, uh, it does seem that we have found our issue to get people uh, to have a sense of urgency about making sure that they have judges who will not destroy their health care. Eric asks, uh, are Democrats prepping monitors to go to polling stations in at-risk areas? I assume by at-risk areas where uh, there'd be efforts to chill voter turnout. Yes, uh, absolutely. And the broader civil rights yeah. community in a nonpartisan way as well. Uh, this is where the um, uh, Leadership Conference for Civil Rights plays such a critical role, uh, mo mobilizing firms across this country. Of course, it was um, uh, you know, first founded by Schneider, Harrison, Siegel, and Lewis, a very famous Jewish firm in Philadelphia, for, you know, to, to help defend civil rights. And what they've built for elections is an impressive uh, movement um, of typically firm lawyers who will be everywhere. Um, so yes, people are very much focused on that. There are, there are other efforts, but I'd say none greater than what the leadership conference does. And David, can you talk about some of those, particularly the legal efforts? Because we've seen where there have been polling places inaccessible or people in line and they tried to close you know, precincts. Uh, seems like lawyers were there almost instantly to uh, file efforts to get stays. Yeah, ben, ben and I don't speak for the Democratic Party, but we're clearly aware of their efforts to do that. But what Ben lifted up is the large number of civic groups, of nonpartisan groups, who are just saying, wherever you're going to vote, you have a right to do it, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that no more, you know, after the Shelby case came down, um, within a couple of years, um, uh, 1,600 um, uh, polling places in 13 states were closed, mostly in communities that made it uh, tougher for uh, minority communities uh, to vote. Um, and so there are efforts to ensure that no more polling places close. There are efforts to ensure that people have a right to vote, that if they're being asked for identification that they don't need, if they're being told that they aren't on the polls, that there are people there that they can go to who can intervene uh, with the uh, monitors there to ensure that the rights that they're entitled to, they're, uh, they're going to have. Um, so there are a lot of efforts to do that uh, on the way from the, uh, uh, the civic communities of America. David, are you... Also, I, I, I misspoke there. I got my LCCRs confused. I meant the lawyers, the lawyers the for civil rights. rights. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot of acronyms in this. See, we think in acronyms. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Um, I, I've, I wonder about how long it may take us to have a winner declared in this election. If it ends up being close and those swing states remain in play because there are uh, even hundreds of thousands of uncounted votes, we could end up weeks past election day with uncertainty about who the next president is going to be. David, you, you have concerns about us being able to be patient and to deal with that period. Look, there, there's a confluence of a lot of factors that are going to be very unsettling and potentially destabilizing. Um, the lack of effort to really prevent uh, the intervention of foreign forces uh, from the lessons of 2016 um, is going to allow for a, a lot of destabilization as a result, uh, in terms of the results of this election. Um, the numbers of people, you said hundreds of thousands, it could even turn into millions of votes just being weighted to be counted because of the backlog in the postal system and the damage done by cuts in the postal uh, system so far. I encourage that there's an hour of public commitment to make no more cuts. Hopefully there'll be pressure to reverse um, uh, some of the cuts, but you very may well may have the, um, uh, the outcome that you are talking about of uncertainty that could go on for a month or so. And I really hope that, uh, that political leaders on both sides of the aisle will stand together to support the system, to ask people to be calm, to let it play out, not to shut off 
people's vote because it can't be counted, um, because it wasn't counted by some arbitrary deadline um, uh, here. But anything that was posted uh, by the time it was supposed to be posted um, should be counted. And we have to ensure uh, that every vote is counted. And we need both parties to stand behind that principle. And your thoughts on that? Yeah, my, my big concern is that because of the nature of our electoral college, because we aren't just going to be counting a national vote, uh, it'll first look like Trump has got, is way up because it'll be a bunch of small states in the middle of the country where it's relatively easy to count the vote, where he's won by wide margins before. And then what you'll see is kind of every couple of days as we try to count over a month, um, you know, Biden will edge up. And then you'll have the Trump message machine going including the whole cottage industry of QAnon, which he refuses to disavow with all kind of crazy conspiracies about how we're watching an election be stolen from the sitting president of the United States. And, and so the longer it goes on, uh, the, the more hysteria that we are likely to see. And the president's message machine seems to be pre preparing for that. If you look at the way that he speaks out of both sides of his mouth about vote by mail, he will tell you in Florida, please, 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 please vote by mail. We have a good Republican governor and it's great in Florida. Well, you, you know what? You also have 32 other Republican governors, but apparently there's a big problem there and in the rest of the country. And so he's literally trying to encourage folks in Florida where he votes because he always votes by mail uh, to say that that's the exception while slamming vote by mail everywhere else when of course uh, the mail has proven to be the least fraudulent way, the safest way to vote time and time and time again. I want to give each of you gentlemen a chance to uh, take a couple minutes to, to close out and, and share your thoughts. Um, Rabbi Saperstein, let me start with you. Just um, as we look forward to the election in November, what are the most critical things for you in, in the work that you're doing uh, to help deal with the challenges ahead? Um, look, I, you know, the loss of bipartisanship in this country is devastating. Every achievement we had in the 20th century came because of a bipartisan coalition of decency and a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious coalition of decency in every community across the, uh, the country. We need that again. Um, uh, here. We've talked about the dangers in this election of things that could undermine uh, the election. I also just want to set the context of the degradation of civil discourse, first in the dark corners of the internet and more publicly exacerbated by the anonymity of social media and the stamp of approval by too many leaders in this country. Um, as Dr. King said, uh, Birmingham church bombing of the poor girls who perish, they have something to say to every politician who has fed his constituents with the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. They say to us that we must be concerned, not merely about who murdered them, but about the system, the way of life, the philosophy, uh, which, uh, which produced the murderer. Um, we need to recognize that hate speech leads to hate crimes. Uh, hate crimes are attacks on everything America stands for. They're aimed at dividing us. And we need to have political leaders who are going to stand together to say that has no place in America. We talked about violence before. The experts tell us that most of the violence comes from right-wing groups um, in this country. They're the ones attacking churches and Sikh temples and mosques and synagogues um, uh, across the uh, uh, country. It's time for us to work together to say it has to end um, uh, here. That remains a central challenge. It should apply in the election. God knows, I hope it will certainly apply after the election. I fear that the damage done to our common wheel is so great, it's gonna take a while. And this kind of divisiveness, is, sadly, is gonna continue. Benjamin Jealous, um, your final thoughts. Sure, you know, tonight, I just, Tonight, as I was uh, looking at all these players, I thought about Jack Kemp, uh, lifelong NAACP member, former quarterback, and of course, a Republican congressman who ran for president. And he was asked when he ran for president, how can you run for president as a Republican and be a card-carrying member of the NAACP? And of course, he had been part of deseg desegregating the NFL. And so he said quite bluntly, you know, I've never thought about that before, but I'll tell you, having thought about it for a second, I've never had a problem fighting for the rights of men I used to shower with every day. 
<laughs> the second thing I would say is that, you know, um, you know, I, I, I really want to thank everybody who's welcomed me, in, me into this role at People Forge. It's been a real joy to be here with you tonight. Norman Lear and Barbara Jordan started this organization in 1981, both to fight the right, but to also not just be interracial or intergenerational, but intersectional, to be very clear that this is about all for one and one for all, that we need to all have each other's backs or, or we will, you know, one by one be kind of picked off in the way that the right has, has always sought to divide and conquer. And the last thing I would close with is this, is, is uh, you know, the words of Frederick Douglass. Uh, Donald Trump's made it hard for me to talk about him and not talk about Frederick Douglass, because of course he thought Frederick Douglass was still alive when he became president. But <laughs> Frederick Douglass, um, maybe his most important speech after the end of slavery, after the Civil War, was called Our Composite Nationality. Frederick Douglass was in many ways the ultimate ally. He wasn't just the most photographed American of the 19th century, which he was. He also, you know, he hadn't just helped end slavery and secure the right to vote for black people. He also said when the right to vote was won, when the 15th Amendment was passed, that he would not cast a vote until women had the right to vote also. But when the 14th Amendment was passed and the native birth provision inserted, and the white supremacists started ginning up anti-immigrant fervor, specifically anti-immigrant of color fervor, saying that the white man would have no place to buy a house in California uh, unless um, the Chinese were sent back home. The, the rising Mongol tide, the rising yellow tide, Frederick Douglass gave one of his most important speeches called Our Composite Nationality. It was his tirade against the Chinese Exclusion Act. He said a lot of important things in there, but the most important thing he said was this, and I'll paraphrase and then I'll quote him, because if you haven't read a 19th century speech, it's best to you know, only quote a little bit of it. He said, every nation has a unique destiny. Its destiny is defined by its character. Its character is that nation at its best, not its worst. At its best, not its worst. That's our character. And that our character is ultimately shaped by our geography and that our geography point out is unique. We're bordered by friendly nations, north and south of different colors and great oceans, east and west that connect us to every people on the planet. And therefore he reasoned that the, the American destiny is to be quote, the most perfect example of the unity and dignity of the human family that the world has ever seen. The most perfect example of the unity and dignity of the human family the world has ever seen. My grandmother is 103 years old and the granddaughter of slaves. And she uh, you know, graduated from Penn in 53, very sharp woman. She would say to you, if she were here, she said to me a little while ago, to keep the faith because it's always darkest before it's dawn. And if we were seeing the numeric end of white supremacy at the polls in front of us, as we are seeing in this decade, or I mean in the century, where by the midpoint, every group will be a minority in this country. And we will all have to get along with at least one of the group demographically to succeed democratically. She said, you would expect that those who are most invested in the old order to lurch to the right in the way that we're seeing right now. And so I would encourage all of us to keep the fight, to keep the faith, to fight for our democracy, to understand that this fight is real. The reason they're so fighting so hard is that the numbers are on our side. And if we just simply show up, fight hard and do our job, we will ultimately win and win decisively. I think ben, it's, I'm, I'm I, glad you- I, I know we're late. I think it's clear yeah. why Ben Jealous is really one of the great public figures in America uh, today. It was an honor to be with him and with you, Larry, and this wonderful program, the leaders of whom are a who's who list of uh, great figures in the Jewish uh, community. One last thing everyone can do, say a prayer for the good health and long life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> uh, David, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, and uh, Ben, I'm glad that you raised uh, women's suffrage and your 103-year-old grandmother. Today is Women's Equality Day. It's obviously the centennial of women's suffrage uh, this year, which we uh, celebrate and observe as well. And of course, Kamala Harris as uh, Joe Biden's partner in uh, this election, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, historic, uh, historic nature there. So we want to make sure that we recognize this Women's Equality Day. Gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I want to thank all of you that have viewed the program tonight. Also, uh, I want to mention coming up, uh, our next program is going to be with CNN's Jeffrey Tubin and UC Irvine's uh, Henry uh, Weinstein about uh, Jeff Tubin's new book, True Crimes and Misdemeanors, The Investigation of Donald Trump. That's coming up next week's program next Wednesday, five o'clock, 
right here. Uh, again, chance for you to hear from some of the most interesting and important speakers week by week. Uh, my thanks to judge and community advocates for inviting me to be a part of this. Wish you a very good evening from both organizations and all the co-sponsors.